your presence here, and um, I'm glad to be back in Barcelona. And tonight I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Pokemon Go and the social, mobile, augmented reality app that um, people are using for fun, but it's also been shown to do great things for people's mental and physical health. Um, so my name is Chai, and I come from Palo Alto, which is near San Francisco. And I am a managing partner at Ideagoras, a small um, agency in based in Madrid. And my Twitter is chiah. Feel free to find me there. So, what are Pokemon? Pokemon is a is a game um, that uh, came out of Japan in 1996. And the creator of it called them Pocket Monsters. And his name is Satoshi Tajiri. And he, had, he was autistic. So when he was a child, he loved going out and collecting bugs and tadpoles. And he would kind of look around and say, OK, so this kind of bug likes to be in this kind of a, an environment. This is where I find them. So he was cataloging bugs and tadpoles as a child. And so when he became older, started um, wanting to make games, he was like, oh, I wonder if I could take that obsession that I had as a child for collecting bugs and make it into something where, where kids all over the world can collect virtual um, bugs and monsters, and that the monsters would have evolutions, like bug, you know, like a caterpillar turns into a butterfly. So what are the different evolutions of these pocket monsters that he was creating? So he's creating this whole world where you, you would be able to find certain types of monsters in certain types of environments. And um, this originally came out on Nintendo, um, you know, on their systems, but, um, you know, he, he's turned it into a worldwide empire since 1996. So, Pokemon Go! Everybody says, well, Pokemon Go is it dead? It was huge oh. in the summer of 19... Uh, oh. It's not dead, I know, I know. In, in 2016, it was it, it hit the you know hit the world like like a tsunami. It was a mobile app phenomenon. It surged quickly to attract a really huge audience, but kind of came down to earth, right? So in 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 the um, you know in the early days when it first came out, 28.5 million people were playing the game, and then by December of that year, it was down to five million. But five million people a day is still a lot of people. So some facts. Um, in the first month that the game came out, it made $207 million, um, just in July 2016. And there were 28.5 million in the US and 45 million global daily active users, which is huge. Um, and by December, that number was 5 million in the, in the US. But one year ago, in May 2018, 147 million global monthly active users and by September of, of 2018, 1 billion downloads. So that's a billion with me. So revenues. So this is just the in-app purchase revenues. And I'm, I'm just showing you these numbers because I want to tell you that this is a game that has some staying power. And this is from people playing the game, spending one, two dollars, or the equivalent of euros, when they play the game. So every, you know, if you want to do certain things in the game, you have to pay a little bit of money. And so this, and this is not the vast majority of people. The vast majority of people are not spending money in the game. And so if they're making $2 million in revenue as of September 2018 and 2.45 by March, so in six months, they made $450 million just from people spending one, two dollars at a time. Um, 800 million in revenue in 2018, and they were making $200,000 a day in April of this year. And they, they also raised money, and their valuation is at $4 billion. So, you know, just, just and this, again, this is in app purchase. So, IAP is in app purchase. So, you can see that this compared to other games, it only take, took them about 811 days to start making $2 billion, to make $2 billion from the launch. Um, they, they reached 800 million in consumer spend very, very quickly in under three months. And the lifetime um, breakdown, which is kind of like you can see how many people are playing in different parts of the world, is kind of a proxy, not, not a great proxy, but you can see 
Japan is about 33%, United States about 30%, and other is all the other countries in the world. It's the other 30%. So this is reaching a global audience, not just in the developed world, but also in, it's big in Brazil and it's huge in India. Compared to other games in um, monthly active users, so you can see, this is just on Android. It's the fifth most used game on Android. And this is after Google Play and Candy Crush Saga. So they're, they're really, really reaching a wide audience. Um, it's, you know, compared to other location-based mobile games, they're pretty much the market. So, um, so I will go into what is a location-based mobile game. So it's, like I said, this is a global phenomenon. So um, you can see that it's not just the US. The US is 16% of the downloads in 2018. The rest, 84% coming from other parts of the world. So player facts. Um, it's 84% of the market in location-based game category, 92% of the revenue in that particular category. It's not a very crowded category, but still. 60% um, of the users are 18 to 34, and 32% are under 18, and 43% are female, which is unlike a lot of video games. A lot of video games tend to skew towards more male, but this is almost 50%, so there's a lot of women playing. Um, and $52,000 is the average household income. So it's, it's people who are doing pretty well um, financially. So there's, a, there's been studies that came out, academic studies that came out, and um, one that came out of Stanford and Microsoft, it showed a 25% increase in baseline daily steps. So it's an average of almost 1,500 steps per day that they wouldn't have been doing if they hadn't been playing this game. Um, the University of Tokyo found that the players over age of 40 walked more than the non-players, and for the ages of 55 to 64, the players walked a lot more than the, that same cohort. Uh, it's, and it's also converting non-mobile time to mobile game play time. So people are not saying, okay, instead of using my phone to play a mobile game, they're, they're just saying, okay, instead of doing something else, like maybe sitting at home and watching television or whatever else they might be doing with their free time, it's converting it into, okay, I'm now playing a game outside with other people, usually. So um, this, this is a really amazing statistic. So if you look at it, um, on Android, total time spent in the top 20 games, Pokemon Go is 45% of the time. So this is total time spent. So people are really engaged. The people who are engaged are very engaged with this game. So the prime time is weekday evenings and weekends. And 57% of the players are playing one to three hours. Um, there's 29% that are playing you know, more than an hour a day, but 14% are playing more than three hours a day. So this is the people who are very engaged are very engaged with this game. 68% of the people say that they just play as they're doing, you know, going around their day, like if they're running an errand or they're um, out and about, hanging out with their friends, they'll just open up the app and play the game. 54% um, are playing alone, but you see that 46% of the people are playing this socially. So they're going out with their friends, they're calling them up and saying, hey, I'm going to go out and play Pokemon Go, do you want to come with me? So. And there's, and there's reasons why this number is really high, and I'll go into that a little bit later. So the basic game, in case you haven't played, what you do is you go out in the real world, and the, um, the GPS in your phone tells the, uh, tells the company where you are. And based on that, it will, it will spawn a virtual monster. So you see it on your phone, and you flip the ball at it to try to catch it, try to capture the, the, the little monster. So it's, it's a game layer on top of real-world points of interest. So how do you know where to find them? Well, so do you see how this is the Pokestop of Old City Hall? And it shows up as a picture in your phone. And so if it says, hey, this Pokemon is close to Old City Hall, you have to get yourself to that physical location in order to be able to capture the monster. 
So it's like th these different layers of reality. So this is the game layer. I'm going to call this the real world layer because it's the, the satellite phone. And then this is the map layer. So you can, you can see it's kind of bringing th this intersection of this game layer into the real world. Because you have to be in the place that this, this pokey stop is or this monster is in order to be able to interact with it. Otherwise, you can't. It will it'll tell you you're too far away or the Pokemon will not show up on your screen. Any questions? I see a puzzled look. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> why, Any? Why, why is that a percentage of female players in this game? Why, 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 why? is the percentage of female players higher in another game? Why do you know the reason? I, I think it's because it's a co cooperative game. Mm -hmm. And I think that it also is not something that you have to go out and, like, you know, shoot guns or, you know, like, virtual guns or, or kill things. It's not, it's not bloody. Um, it's a game that is, is really built on social play. And I think that's why it appeals to more women than um, other games. And it's, it's really um, a few different things. There's, I'll, I'll go into the different mechanics that they use to get people engaged. And I think, I think that might help answer the question, but we can also talk about that a little bit more after I go through the, you know, all the things that they're using to get people to play. Yes? You said that basically is the category, the yes. location-based games category is Pokemon Go. Yes. Uh, but you also said that it's not that big. I mean, the category. Do you yes. know? Do you know how big it is? Uh, I'm not entirely sure. Okay. Um, because it, it, it's kind of hard to find that out. But um, it's it's pretty much most of the categories. Ninety-two percent of the um, of the revenue in that in that category. I mean, the region uh, where you know, in Japan or in, uh, in the US, mm -hmm. where there are more players, mm -hmm. are um, the healthcare professionals recommending to play Pokemon Go? I don't think anyone's recommending it as a, as a health mm -hmm. um, thing, mm -hmm. but I would love to encourage people to think about doing that no. because this, is, this has been a, a really interesting um, community and subculture that um, I think a lot of people are not aware of. So when I've gone out and played, the age range is four to 80 something. And the, the retired um, people are the most engaged with the game. So they, they go out in the morning, they have their routine, right? Like they, they tell me if I talk to them. I mean, I normally wouldn't meet a lot of retired people, but I met uh, quite a few playing this game. And they tell me like, yeah, you know, I have this, this routine in the morning, I get up, I spin these stops, I go to these gyms, I go and collect these coins out of the gyms, and then I go on a few raids, and then, you know, I, I walk around for the rest of the, you know, morning, catching Pokemon. And then, um, and then I'll, you know, meet people at a raid, and then we'll, you know, trade Pokemon. So it's, it's like this whole um, thing that keeps them very active. Mm -hmm. Yes? Do you have any information about which customer group broke away when the sharp decrease came? Do you know if that was more on the youth side or more on the retired side? So there's a question about the age breakdown for people who stop playing. I'm not really sure. I don't have those numbers. Um, I'm sure Niantic does, but I'm not entirely. I don't think they share that. Okay. So, yeah, Niantic has a lot of data on us, the people playing. Okay, so I will go on to the next. So points of interest. So points of interest are uh, become um, gyms and Pokestops. So gyms are, are places where you can interact um, with a point of interest by um, fighting other Pokemon and putting them in the gym, and that's how you get coins for the day. And um, Pokestops are the, the places where you go up to it and you can spin it to get items. So you get balls, you get things that you get to use in the game. And the daily engagement is driven by rewards. So they really reward people for playing every single day. So when you first spin your stop, it tells you, hey, this is your you know, first Pokestop stop of the day. You have a four day streak going. And so they really want you to like do it every day for seven days because at the end of seven days, you get more rewards and more in-game items. And again, you catch a Pokemon every day, you get 
first catch of the day streak, so you get more points for catching that first Pokemon. So it keeps people like going, okay, so today I have to, you know, I have to do this at least once. And then there's also research tasks that you do once a day. And you have to do one to get the stamp, and once you get the stamp and you get seven of them, you get a really special Pokemon. And so this is how they keep people like, okay, okay, I have to I have to play this game to try to get everything. Um, so I can catch the special thing at the end of the week. So how are they getting people together in real time? So there's there's raids and events. So I'm going to tell you quickly about raids and events. And it's building a hyper local community. And how they're doing it is there's doing time limited. I guess you can call them events, small <laughs> events, where you go up to a gym and you have to fight the monster. So you can see on that, it tells you, you have a, an hour and 45 minutes to find that gym, show up, and bring your friends. Because you need a certain number of people to be able to beat the monster that hatches out of the egg. And if you don't have enough friends who come with you, you have to find other people in the area to help you beat that monster. If you don't have enough people, you can't beat it. Like if you only have one person and you're trying to beat something that takes five, it'll say, well, okay, so you, it'll let you do it, but you just will not be able to, to, to defeat it fast enough to catch it. So it's very limited time. So once it hatches, you only have 45 minutes to get there. And you have to, you have to get there all within the same time frame. Because each raid doesn't take that long. It only takes about three minutes to, to actually raid. But that means that you have to get people all there at the same time, you have to coordinate. And so it's hyper-local because you see the same people who either work in the area or live in the area. And you'll see the same people over and over again. And after a while, you start talking to them. You know, it's kind of like the old, old um, times when you'd have like a local corner store and you'd see the same person at the store over and over again. And that's how you became neighbors and friends. And so it's, it's really, bringing that kind of community back into the larger cities, um, I think. I mean, you can, you can also like go to the raid and not talk to anyone, but you know, at least for me, I like being social. I like, you know, if I've seen you there you know, in the last 10 days and we keep kind of running into each other, it's like, oh, hey, you know, what's your name? And, and the game also incentivizes you to start interacting with the people that you meet that are also playing. So the raids are cooperative, time and location bounded. So you have to go to that location to be able to, to raid. Um, it's cooperative because you have to have that number of people who are there and you're incentivized to help the other people because let's say you don't know how to play very well and you show up and you know, you're know you a lower level and we all, need, we, we all need your help to be able to beat the monster. I'll, I'll say, okay, so you want to use this monster and not that one, this one's more powerful against this thing. I mean, I, I don't know that much about Pokemon because I didn't really grow up with it the, other, the way that a lot of people I meet who play the game have. So they'll say, oh yes, well, you know, this one is a stone-based monster, so it's good against this kind of, you know, other, you know, the psychic or whatever. I, I cannot keep track. But the people around me will tell me, okay, this is what you need to do. And so it, it fosters that kind of interaction. And someone like kind of glances over your phone and goes, oh yeah, you don't want to use that one because I want your help to beat this monster. You want to use this one, this one, this one instead. So it's it's this kind of inter these kind of little interactions that you, you end up getting into when you're at the same place at the same time. So you can see it says a lot closer to interact with this gym. You're not close enough. You have to get up to that that location to be able to play. And it shows you here are the seven other people inside who are going to do this raid with you. So you see them on your screen. All right. So last weekend. I was in Palencia, a small city in Spain. I knew nobody there, um, but because I had friends who needed to be in the area, they said, well, we're gonna drop you off in the downtown area, you can walk around. And I said, all right. So I knew there was a, a special event going on, and so I found a few gyms, and I was kind of looking around, and I was like, oh yeah, that giant group of people, they're playing. So I found this group of about 50 people who were playing Pokemon Go, and I don't speak much Spanish, and they didn't speak much English, but I was like, Hey, uh, Pokemon Go! <laughs> so, we, uh, we, I ended up making um, seven new in-game friends. 
And we, you know, we communicated well enough to be able to trade, to be able to raid, to be able to catch Pokemon. So, so it's, you know, it, it was, it was funny, right? <coughs> I didn't know anybody in the city, and I just showed up, and and I wasn't connected to them through any other means. So there's no way to message people in game. Niantic really said, you know what? We don't want to deal with all the headaches of you know people being able to message each other in the game. And so what you have to do is you have to find the other channels that people are communicating on. So that there's this whole subculture of how do you communicate with other people to tell them which raid we're all going to. So it's different in different parts of the world. I've been asking people. So in Madrid, people are using Telegram. In um, Valencia, they were all using WhatsApp. In uh, the US, they're using Discord. So it's, it's outside the game, but you have to find the channel where people are talking. There are some people who are talking on Facebook Messenger. So it just it depends on the, the local community, what they decide that they all want to use to communicate with each other. So this is a crowd that, that showed up on a community day in uh, Mountain View. So I don't know how many hundreds of people were there that day, but it was a lot of people. And they're also having special events. So they are having an, they had an event in Chicago. They had a special event in Japan. They also had one in Germany. And this is this is like kind of invite only. They make it a little exclusive, so you, you're not guaranteed to get in. People are flying in from all over the world sometimes to, to go play the game. Um, and uh, there was an event in San Jose, California, that drew thirty thousand people. Like thirty thousand people opened the app to play this game. It was crazy. People were coming in from all over to play the game. So, so it's very social. So there's social and gifting. So gifting means that you can spin a Pokestop, you get a gift, and you send it to your friend who's in-game. And since it launched in June of last year, 2.2 billion gifts have been sent. Um, you can now do snapshots. You could like take a Pokemon that you captured, send, like take a picture of it, send it to your friends through social media or however you want to send a photo. Um, the, trade, the trading launched last year, and it used active players to bring back the players that were playing in 2016. And, and I got brought back by one of my friends in this way because they said so. You were playing the game in 2016. I said, yeah, but I got bored of it. And they said, log in now. I need a new friend for this for this new um, field research. And if you have a Pokemon from 2016 and you trade it to me, then we'll both get lucky Pokemon. And I was like, what? I have no idea what you're talking about. But they were really insistent. They said, no, no, really, log in. So I, I spent like hours trying to log back into my old account. <laughs> What was my password? What was the email I used? So it, it's, it's really interesting how they're really using social to drive engagement. And I think they're real, being really smart about it. So this is, this is you know, sort of social mixed reality. So a game, uh, I'm sorry, the, the gift. So what you do is you spin a Pokestop, you get a gift, and this is what it looks like. And it's like a virtual postcard that someone can send you from anywhere in the world, around town. And then when you open it, it gives you in-game items that you get to use. It's cooperative gameplay. So you walk around with your friend, you will see the same Pokemon, and you are going to help your friend catch them, right? Like you see a really rare Pokemon, you go, oh wow, look over there, there's a Bronzor, let's both go and get it. So, so you both can go and capture it. It's not like, I get there first and I catch it and you don't have a chance at it. It's, it's the same Pokemon. So if I say, oh, wow, that one has really good, um, good statistics, you'll get the same one. And there's a, there's a thing called the radar on this. And your radar will be slightly different than mine. So you'll see a different, po like a different Pokemon on the radar. So when we're playing together, if we're walking together, I have a better chance of knowing what's around me because I have more people around me. Whereas, you know, I only have my radar and I only get my nine. So if I have more people, that means that everybody gets nine and we all have slightly different ones. And so maybe, you know, maybe you'll be able to see a more rare Pokemon that I, that's not on my radar. And then we can both go catch it. 
So this is, you know, this, as you can see, they're seeing the same map, and they're seeing the same Pokestop. So the other thing is you can say to your friend, oh, what? I just found this Pokestop. It has a really, really good, um, a really, really good uh, field research today because you'll get a really rare Pokemon once you complete the field research. So that kind of, they, they put all these little cooperation things in there. So you can play it without it, but it's much more fun if you have your friends who are also telling you, hey, this is what's going on around you. So driving user behavior. How is it driving more steps? Because it's showing you on this radar a rare Pokemon. So now you have to walk over and find it. On, so it shows you on the map, like, oh, look, there it is. That, the little pink footprint thing, that's where you have to go. So you have to navigate your way over there. And then once you get over there, it'll show you new Pokemon because you're in a new place. It'll say, oh, now, now here's what's nearby. And it prioritizes the Pokemon that you don't have. So you're more incentivized to go, oh, I have to go, I have to go find it. There's also another mechanic called egg hatching. So you get eggs in game and you have to put them in incubators and then you have to walk five kilometers, 10 kilometers, or two kilometers to hatch them. And it's a surprise. You don't know what's going to come out of that egg. So it's a little bit like surprise and delight. So it's using that mechanic. Like, okay, I just have to walk another few kilometers, or another half a kilometer, and I'll find out what's in the egg. Okay, so I'm gonna go out and walk. And they also have a different mechanic where if you walk a certain number of kilometers in that week, you'll get something special if you walk 50. And so I have known people who are like, okay, it's Sunday night, and we know that it's going to be Monday that you're going to get the special thing. And I am at 49.4 kilometers. I just need 0.6. Like, I've known people who are like, okay, I, 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 I'm, in, I'm in my pajamas. We're gonna put on our shoes and go walk that final, you know, 0.6 kilometers, just so I can make sure on Monday morning I get the special item. So. It's it's a it's a funny little thing. It's a it's tiny though, right? It's not this. These are not big, right? These are little things that you, that, that are driving human behavior. Um, you it's a co you, you can put up cooperative lures. So for every Pokestop, if you have a lure, you could put it in that lure, and it benefits you, but it also benefits anybody who walks by. So strangers, your friends, whatever. It just makes the Pokemon sp spawn faster. And it shows up in everybody's map. So it have the, the Pokestop will have these pink petals, and every um, three minutes, a new Pokemon will show up. And if you've, if you've played the game in, a, in one area, and you don't have a lure up, if you catch your, all the Pokemon, no more will spawn. So you have, to, you have to go walk, because it takes half an hour for them to respawn. So you have to walk and, and find new ones. So if you really want to play the game, you know, you can't just sit in one place and go, okay, well, I'm just going to sit here and catch Pokemon. So, a Finnish university study found that there was a positive relationship between players' emotional, spiritual, and intellectual wellness. There was a University of Wisconsin-Madison study where players make new friends and they strengthen existing friendships. And I will say that's been really true in, in my experience because the people who got me to play again, they actually have kids and you know I don't I didn't see them that much. But when I started playing the game again, they'd be like, okay, so are you coming out? We're coming out. So <laughs> you know like we're gonna pack up the kids, we're gonna go outside, so you're gonna come with us on this walk. So I hadn't seen some of the people who had had you know two children for quite a long time, but suddenly they were like, hey, you wanna go out and you know catch some Pokemon? Um, and there's a lot of anecdotal reports on social media from people who are saying on Twitter, you know what, playing Pokemon Go has helped my social anxiety. Pokemon Go has uh, you know, helped cure my depression because it gets me up and out of the house every day so I can meet people to, to play the game or capture Pokemon. Um, so it's not, it's not a you know, huge study, but there's been a lot of people who have said, you know, this game has helped me a lot in terms of mental health. Um, so, you know, the raids, it's local friends, and social pressure because you need other people to come out. So you're you're incentivized to call up your friends and say, okay, who's coming? We're gonna all, all meet at you know 10 in the morning at this raid. 
because we all want this monster really badly. It's rare, and it's only here for the next four days. So let's go. We're all going to go and get it. So, so you know, you, you really kind of get that social pressure because you're, you're like, if you don't come, we're not going to get it. <laughs> so you, you get your friends, you know, that way. Or maybe, you know, it's your, your turn the next day going, come on, guys, let's all go. And it's, it's a completionist thing, right? This is the other mechanic. You want to collect them all, right? You want to, you want to be the person like, oh, I've, I've, got all the, I've got all the Pokemon. Um, there's a lot of them now. There's 400 and something. But when we started, it was about 150. <laughs> and they also have special shiny Pokemon. It's a slightly different color. Um, they spawn at a rate of 1 in 450. So you have to encounter 450 of this Pokemon to maybe get one of these. And there are special events in which they, they spawn more often, so the rates are higher. And so that gets people out, right? Like, you're like, OK, I've got to go find this rare Pokemon. It's only going to be here for the next few hours, so I better go and get one now. Um, so it's, it's kind of like, you know, for showing off, right? Like, you're like, oh, I have, I have this special shiny one. So it's kind of like a little bit of gambling, right? Because you don't know if the next one, because it doesn't show up on the map as shiny. You have to click on each one. And once you click on it, then it says, oh, I'm shiny, or I'm not shiny. So another one, player engagement by trading, or I call it social gambling. So you can trade Pokemon between your friends now. And um, it costs a certain amount of in-game um, currency. People do it. And um, you also have this mechanic of if you want to do an evolution, you need candies for these Pokemon. So some, some Pokemon only take 12 candy, some take 50, some take 100. And if you can trade with your friend a Pokemon that is more than, from a more, you caught them in more than 100, 100 kilometers away, you get three candy. So you get a little bit closer. So you're kind of incentivized to take your Pokemon and trade it with your friends um, so that you can get more candy so you can do the evolution faster. And there's also lucky Pokemon. And that means that you get to spend less of the in-game currency to power it up, to be able to go fight at the gym, to be able to use it in player-to-player -player battles. And why is this important? Because you have to trade with your friends. You can't get this any other way. So you're incentivized to go out and find other people who are also playing the game to trade with you. Like, and you and I are strangers, but you might have something that I really want, and maybe you've traveled lately from somewhere else. And that's why in Valencia they were like, oh, so you want to trade, right? Because, because they, they knew that I had, I had Pokemon from California, and for everything they traded me, they would get three candies for it, which is, you know, faster evolution to whatever it is that they need to get an evolution of. So, any questions on just the gameplay? I'm going to go back into the history of this game a little bit, just so you kind of know where it came from. So we game, uh, posters, uh... Social interaction. Yes. Uh, and physical activity. Yes. And cooperation. Yes. Regarding physical activity, which kind of metrics do that does the app provide? So the app only provides you how many kilometers. Yes, it's fine. That's pretty much it. It just is possible to obtain the kilometers and I use it in the app? Uh, you can if you click on you. Um, and it, it should, um, so it's, it, you sh it shows you if you've walked 5 kilometers, 10 kilometers, or 50 kilometers. You don't get calories or... No, no, you just get... Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. One question regarding the new initiative uh, where you can trade old Pokemon for new ones. Yes. Get rewards. Uh, did they really see an increase in players now? since they launched that initiative? I think they did. I don't, I mean, I can't, I, 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 they haven't announced that, okay. but just from the numbers alone, um, the fact that they had the best month that they had since launch, okay. May, yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Is there a, a, some kind of API or something like to, to customize this game for a specific, for example, for a health uh, care institution or so the question was, is there an API for customizing this game for an institution? And the answer is no. Oh, and is it in the roadmap or uh, no, no 
Halloween. Um, so they're actually coming out with a new game called Harry Potter. Harry Potter. Yes. Okay. okay. So, so they they you know they're they're trying to use this engine that's underneath. So I'm sure if you paid them enough money, they would probably build something. <laughs> but I'm not sure what that enough money is because they made 800 million dollars in 2018 from players. But this is just for consumer. It's oriented to consumer. Not they actually. Players. No, that's not true. Um, so I'm only telling you about the consumer spend. <laughs> they actually have brand tie-ins. So every single Starbucks in the U.S. is a Pokey Stop or a Jim. And they were getting crazy money from that. It was 50 cents per impression. Spin. I think, I'm not sure if that's the price now, but that was the price at launch. So, you know, there, there are brand tie-ins. They, they've tied it into um, quite a few brands internationally as well. So, yeah. They, they will, they, you know, they, they're happy to take your money. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, where did Niantic start? So, Niantic is the company that built this game. Um, so, they came out of Google. And this is the tech underneath. So I'm not talking about the Pokemon because the Pokemon is a separate licensing. This is, you know, how, how, did, how did we even get this? Um, they started at Google and um, it was originally a joke. It started off as a, a, a you know, April Fool's Day. Like on Google Maps, you can go find Pokemon. Um, and the original, the, but the original game predated that joke. It was called um, Ingress. And it was a very, very science, science fiction, geeky game, and it definitely did not have the sort of wide appeal that this game has. Um, and, you know, it, it, looked like, it looked like this. It was very, you know, black and dark. There were portals. You went and did things at them. It was, it was based in, real, you know, in the real world, like the game is, but they Pokemon Go basically reskinned this game. So yeah, it started as an April Fool's Day joke. They were like, hey, you know what? We're like, Wouldn't it be funny if we, you know, put Pokemon on our Google Maps? Yeah, that would be hilarious. So they did it, and then they were like, wait a minute. We have a location-based game where we could actually do this. So they, I think that's when they started talking to, uh, to Nintendo and doing this. Um, how did they populate the data? Points of interest from maps. So, you know, this, I know people are like, can I build this? And it's like, well, yeah, if you have that kind of resources. So I'll tell you what kind of resources you need. It's a lot. Um, first of all, you need a whole map of the world and you need the points of interest. So Google, Google is gathering all that data already for maps, right? Like, you know, what's a point of interest? Churches. So okay. in the beginning, it was like, okay, so churches were, um, automatically in as a Pokestop. Museums and aquariums, yeah, points of interest. Okay, we, we know where they are on the map. We'll just make them a thing, like inside the game. Libraries, and these photos were user generated. So they crowdsourced it. How did they crowdsource it? Well, they're Google. They were like, hey guys, we're all at Google. You guys wanna go out and take pictures? They, they came, this came from Ingress. Right, so ingress players were taking photos of real world places and putting them in the servers so that they could use it for Pokemon Go. So in the beginning when Pokemon Go first launched, there were certain things that really shouldn't have been in the map. You know, like people that put in strip clubs. Like kind of not cool for a for a children's game. <laughs> but you know, they, they cleaned that up. Um, you know, there were some sometimes like private property um, Think, like items on private property that you know the, the people who own the property were like, we do not want this, so they could write in and tell them to take it off. But you know, when it first launched, like there are some churches that are not friendly to Pokemon, so like they asked to be taken off. So it's it's yeah. So you know, there's San Francisco Zoo. Um, so it's it's crowdsourced, real world location markers. Um, that, that photo was taken by somebody, a user. So, you know, it's not like Niantic sent out an army of people saying, okay, now I'm going to take all the pictures. So, you know, if you're, if you're wanting to build something like this, it's, it's quite an undertaking. 
yeah, user generated. So people, you know, people now it's, instead of just the park, you can say the statue at the park. And you know, a lot of restaurants and cafes were using this, like, hey, you know, come in and uh, play the game, be here. Um, so the future of this game, we'll see. We don't know because they are they are launching a new game. They're launching. Um, they're launching the Harry Potter game shortly. It's been delayed, of course. And um, it's, it's unknown what will happen um, with you know, this new game launching, how much of the current user base will suddenly kind of go play the new game, but this is where we are at. So thank you, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions.